Thank you. Thank you so much to Peter and thank you, Ruth, for that nice introduction. Um, I have to say that secretly, I am glad to be here in September rather than January. But then I just learned that you can skate up and down the river. And this is something that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. So actually, maybe that would have been really nice. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Um, I am talking to you about something that is very close to my heart, which is the site of Vindolanda, which anyone who was here yesterday started to hear a bit about it from Alex Meyer, who's right over here. We've both been working there for quite some time, about 20 years. And the site is just one of those places that is the gift that keeps on giving. You just, it's amazing. From writing tablets, which you heard about yesterday, to the over 5,000 Roman shoes that I work with. Um, and if you're thinking, really, that many Roman shoes? Yes, that, that many Roman shoes. We have thousands of Roman shoes. You're only going to hear about five of them or so today. <laughs> I've got about five slides of shoes. So uh, it's not all shoes today, but I will bring those in because they are a fan favorite. And anyone who's actually heard the podcast um, for, that Melissa does, um, that was what, last? Was that last year? Gosh, they can't put it all together. I'm no idea what that's great. That was all about shoes. Um, and we had some good laughs in that as well. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about this issue here that you see with local and global dynamics and a Roman frontier settlement. So I'm looking very closely at one particular part of the excavation. But let's just zoom out a little bit. We have a lot of people in here today and maybe some people that don't exactly know where Vindolanda is or know much about that whole area of the provinces and the frontier as well. I work all the way up here in this northwest corner, the province that we call Britannia, which of course got its, um, gave it the, the name to Britain today. And that was conquered by the Emperor Claudius. It was brought into the Roman Empire in about 43 CE. So that's really where our story starts for, for that province. Vindolanda, however, is all the way up on the northern frontier. And you can see it just right here. I don't have a pointer, so I will just use this, and that can be seen okay, right? Um, Vindolanda is right here in the middle of that northern frontier. The map you're looking at shows you a couple of things. This line right here is called the Stain Gate. That's actually the early frontier that was from around sort of the 70s, 80s CE onward. And then the more familiar green dotted line is Hadrian's Wall. It would become Hadrian's Wall. And for anyone who's been to the UK and is thinking they need some modern geography, it is between Newcastle and Carlisle. We're almost up there in Scotland. When you're over on this side of the country, Scotland is just right over here. When you're on this side, Scotland is way up here. The border kind of goes like this. So we're north of Scotland. Oftentimes people say, oh yeah, Hadrian's Wall in Scotland. And I don't know why that comes about, but it's not. Um, it is actually in England. But we're way up north there. And when you see it from that sort of provincial perspective or the, the perspective of the Roman Empire, thinking about that whole thing being the empire, um, it, it's quite something to think about that northwest corner. So we're zooming into Roman Britain. We're zooming into the frontier up there and looking at even a smaller area, this one site that just tells us so much about what life is in fact like or was like on this Roman frontier back in, um, you know, about 2000 years ago. So what we have, has anyone visited the site? Has anyone ever been there? I knew there's always one person there. Yes, Connor, we have, we have hosted Connor. There's always one person other than these jokers down here who has been there. So that, that's exciting, one or two. Um, when you walk on the site, for those of you who have not been there yet, but surely will at some point visit this amazing site. Um, if you're ever up on Hadrian's Wall, I'm not biased or anything. It is your bang for your buck. You go there. You don't go anywhere. You don't go to Housesteads, right, Connor? You don't go to Housesteads. You go to Vindolanda. Um, when you walk in, what you're seeing, so the archaeology that you can see today are the visible remains of the what we call the third century. It's our period seven. It's our, our um, second stone fort. It's this very robust stone. All of those remains that you see in black are all well... Um, well entrenched on the site. In other words, you can see them, you can see that they're buildings, they're not just sort of, um, you know, some rubble and stone that, that that's sort of bouncing around. Um, it's very clear buildings, barracks, you can even make out um, what you're looking at. The, the site is interpreted in, I think, four or five languages at this point as well. So, you know, come and, and practice your languages as well when you're there. That's what you see when you're there. And this is an image that just shows you what that looks like. So you're looking from that little corner standing about where that star is and looking this way. So that's how um, well-preserved all of that stone is. 
But what you cannot see, and what I'm going to be talking about today, and what Alex was talking about yesterday, is everything that's actually under your feet at that point. We have layers upon layers upon layers. There's um, kind of, say, nine settlement layers, but really we're kind of, there, there are all these sub phases. And so that's kind of probably more like 11 these days. But what you're not seeing when you're on this site, underneath all of that stone are, is a couple of meters of archaeology. And is that coming out okay up there? You can kind of make out the differences here. There are, in fact, four timber forts that are our earliest layers. We call periods one through four. Down below all of that, you've got one right here. That's that light blue that you can really only just make the edge out because everything keeps overlapping. The next phase, period two, three, which is three is a rebuild of two, is that pink phase right there. And then the one I'm going to be talking about more closely today is this green fort just here. That's our largest fort um, that was ever built on the site, stone or, uh, or timber. So what we have here are these, these early timber forts. The first one, that blue one there, started around, um, we give it a date of about 85 CE. Then you have your period two, which is about, so that was the first period is about 85 to 90. And then you're looking at about 90 to 105 for these periods two to three. And then the period four from about 105 to 120. So there was that time period between about 85 CE, so late first century into the early second century. And there's four precise or distinct, I should say, periods of occupation, different forts that were built one on top of the other. You might be saying, why are they built one on top of the other? Because they always just kind of knock these things down and they build a new fort. And one of the reasons you can tell is look at these sizes. They all had different requirements. This was a unit of 500 men, a quinguinary cohort. This right here, this huge green one, period four, that had a unit of what's called a miliary unit. That would be 1,000 men nominally, not exactly. Um, but they also had cavalry with them. So you have different requirements. Timber forts don't last that long. You knock it down, you build a new one. Now, on this slide, I've also given you the units. We know a lot about, because of those writing tablets that Alex talked about yesterday and from inscriptions as well, we know a lot about the units. I've given those to you to, as something to think about later, the cohorts one tungrorum, the cohorts ninth Batavorum. If you're thinking to yourself, wow, none of these really sound terribly Roman, that is exactly what I want you to get out of that. And we will bring that up again later towards the end of the talk. I'm going to present to you all the archaeology I want you to see, and then we're going to analyze it. So those pre-Hadrianic forts at Vindolanda, they are sitting right on what was called the, the sort of original frontier line. And I put that in quotations because there's, you know, some debate about whether we can call it a frontier at that point in time. That's not really our issue here. We don't need to worry about that. It was called the Stainegate Road. So you'll hear terms like the Stainegate Frontier if you're thinking about um, the early phases of the Roman frontier in Britain. And there it is again on that location, right on that early road there. Let's zoom in on that period four. So I am going to be using a case study that is very specifically from this period four settlement. So about 105 to 120. And you can see the whole fort outlined in red there now. So that's the equivalent to that green square and the other ones. And some of the spaces that have actually been excavated. But we're actually going to zoom right into this right here outside of the fort walls. So in 2012-13, the very end of the 2012 excavation season, and then for a good part of the beginning of the 2013 season, we were kind of discovered by pure chance, 2012 was an insanely rainy year. And what happened was we actually had to come up higher on site. So the whole site goes slopes down here and we were working somewhere down here and it was actually just flooding, everything was flooding. And we had to work up higher on site. So we came up this big hill, we worked at the top of this kind of big slope on the site. And lo and behold, find one of the most amazing kind of areas that we, this is the way archaeology goes. You, it's like the very end of the season. It's by pure chance. These sorts of things happen all the time. So we happened upon um, what we call the extramural areas. Extramural just means outside of the walls. And that's really interesting and important for us because that is not, we do not have lots of evidence for the extramural occupation from any of these early forts. If we were to jump back to that fort right there, I could show you that this is the fort. I didn't really give you the, the details of this. That right there is the fort, and all of this is what we call extramural. And that could traditionally also be called the vicus, if you've ever heard the vicus, that term. 
Um, that is really interesting to, to, to research or generally, particularly to the work that I do, because I'm very interested in all of those people that were not soldiers. I'm actually not really a, people say, oh, great, you know everything about the Roman army. I say, well, you know, don't actually care that much about the Roman army and the soldiers. I'm sort of much more interested in all of those people that were, were sort of trucking along with them and living their lives to the beat of the military drum. And, you know, you can't do that without understanding the soldiers, but I don't actually care that much about them. Other than the fact that the, 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 what they bring with them in this context right here is a, a huge um, sort of conundrum, a sort of complexity of identity and of status and who these people are living on this site, because these are not legionary soldiers. These are not you know, those pictures that you see with the um, big, you know, armor and all this business and there. That's not who we're talking about or, you know, any of the movies that we've had any recent good Roman army movies. But so maybe I won't date myself horribly by naming some of the older ones. But we're not talking about those soldiers. We're actually talking about auxiliary soldiers. They are non-citizens. They are recruited into the military from conquered parts of the empire. So that is fascinating to me. This is, this is why I do like them. Because they come into the military, they are a part of that very mechanism of conquest, yet they are, they are conquered peoples themselves. But then they become that voice and that, the, the, the feet and the hands of further conquest of the Roman Empire, which I just find fascinating. And then you have all these families that come along with that. You have all these women and children and all of these um, hangers on and slaves and servants and all, depending on what class and what, what, what your status is. So there's, it's a complexity that I find really, really fascinating. Um, so we have a fair bit of information. We have all of those buildings outside of the, the fort in that period that I was talking about the corresponds there. But in these early periods, we did not have any of that. So why is this evidence so interesting and exciting? Maybe it is only to me, but I think that I'm making my voice heard here that it's really cool because we have almost no, we have no extramural settlement from the early periods of occupation of Vindolanda. This is it. This is the first bit. And they all have excellent preservation conditions. So that these are all actually in what we call reduced oxygen or anaerobic or anoxic layers. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the talk. So excellent preservation conditions. So we're seeing a lot more of the sort of daily detritus of these people than we would normally see um, in, in normal archaeological conditions. And I I'll, I'll, will tell you more about that. This is also the period when the frontier is being sort of developed in this region. So it, it's, it's, it's under establishment at this point in time. We're sort of towards the end, but we still have evidence that there's a great deal of um, of volatility in around 105 at the start of this period. Um, so we're in, we're, we're really seeing that phase of transition of conquest. And um, when the military is really kind of settling themselves, but we also have all of everything that comes with conquest, right? With local um, groups and local tribal units moving around and the Romans sort of establishing these lines because they're trying to cut up these, these, these traditional um, communication lines and things like that. So it's a really interesting period and really potentially a volatile period as well. So we can also now compare the intramural evidence, meaning the evidence from inside the fort from the periods two through four from those early periods with something from outside and with later extramural occupation on site. So we have now, we can kind of triangulate, does the material culture, let's say, look different outside the fort than it is inside? And this is something I'm working on right now with, I should say a lot of this work that I'm talking about is with um, a colleague of mine, Andrew Burley, who is the director of excavations at Vindolanda. And we are working on a, a lot of different aspects of this, um, this particular material together. So com comparing that intramural and extramural is pretty important for us. Um, and also, we know a good bit about this period and the population from those writing tablets that you heard about yesterday that, that Alex was talking about. So we have a lot of evidence that we can really bring in to understand this period as a whole. And so that's why this is really interesting and exciting. So let's get to that case study. So period four, extramural structures, they're on the north side of the fort, as you saw on that plan. And what we have when we zoom in on here, we don't have 25 buildings. I wish we had 25 buildings. I wish we could keep excavating. We're actually talking about two structures. They're really interesting, though. If you just look right away, you can see, wow, uh, we have a round house. If we just want to kind of 
boil it right down to its basics. We have a round house next to a square house, which archaeologists like to call rectilinear. That just means square. And here it is in the ground. So that was the plan before. And here's what it actually looks like on an aerial photograph. So the two different buildings obviously immediately present their differences. And so right away, we were thinking, oh, this could be a really interesting case study for understanding who is living in this extramural settlement. Do we have locals who are moving in? Do we have Romans and locals mixing? And what, But then what do you even mean by Romans on this site? We don't actually really have any true Romans. Like if you're thinking of Roman as an Italian or something like that, unless we have, let's say, vexillations of legionary soldiers coming up, but it doesn't seem, so what we even mean on a site like this by Roman is completely up in the air and actually just saying, uh, did the Romans do this mean, has, has zero meaning. It just means nothing. And when you're talking about the auxiliaries, their families, the, the kind of complex mix of people that we have on a site like this. But when you look at these two things, the round and rectilinear structures stand side by side, as you can see, just to show you a little bit of what you're looking at here. If, in case you're not getting your eye into this, this right here is the side of one rectilinear structure. We don't have this other side, probably went you know down here-ish, something like that. We've got a little porch out here. That is a later phase. You can probably make out that that rectilinear goes underneath that wall right there. So that's an earlier phase. The round structure, you can also see, um, you can't make out quite as well, but that also had two phases. So it seems like this whole complex had two phases, each one. You just, the, the, rec, the roundhouse is built just a little bit more right on top of it. So you're not really making it out in this image. So when you first approach this, so why is this talk called the local and the global? When you first approach this, if you just take an old, old binary, which we don't really talk in binaries anymore, but if you just take an old binary and you say, oh, Cool, look at that. The locals, when we think of Iron Age Britain, what the Romans found when they got there, roundhouses. They built round houses, they had that fruits, you know, all this kind of stuff. And who likes the rectilinear houses? The Romans. The Romans come along and they say, we build square buildings. And that generally is true, but actually not really. Because when you ask yourself, does that round form actually stand out as different in this, and I actually should have put Roman in little quotations here, in this Roman context, it actually doesn't. And there's a lot more work that's been going on in the last sort of 10 to 20 years that suggests that, in fact, maybe the rectilinear structure is the weird one. The Romans coming in and building all of this, these straight lines and these square corners, psh, that's not really what we do here. And in fact, at Vindolanda even, in the third century, so if you look at this date, the Severan period, that's around 200 to 212 at Vindolanda, the early third century, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of roundhouses right outside of the fort. They're built in stone. It's a slightly different construction. If we look out in the rural countryside, all around Northern Britain and, and other parts of Britain, actually the roundhouse structure persists. So in fact, when we think about you know, it, it does this actually stand out in a Roman context? Not actually necessarily, but it does stand out the fact that you have a rectilinear house standing directly next to a roundhouse. And I say roundhouse, we do think that they're domestic spaces. We think they're houses, and that's because of the material culture packages that are inside, the pottery, the various items, and we're going to go through that in just a minute. So we do have some sort of mixture of traditions, at least here, whether it's the same group of people, whether it's the, the same complex and people are just, for some reason, choosing two different construction styles, or if we really do have people packed in here. And this is where we would love to see much more of this area, if we could open it up, and we really just can't right now, but if we could open it up and see, oh, actually, it's just these two houses next to each other, and then you've got 25 feet of space, and then you've got two other houses. But there are little pieces of evidence, and in fact, this is where Andy and I are going to go next with this, that elsewhere on site, we have this rectilinear round combination right next to each other. So that's sort of like, watch this space in a couple of years, and I'll put that article out, and you can email me and ask me for it. But um, for now, we're going to look at this space as, okay, interesting, we've got a discrete round structure next to a discrete rectilinear structure, and let's see what we can do with that. So you've got this immediate difference. You've got the round and the, and the, and the square. What happens when we look at the material culture? Because it would be really easy, and you know, 50 years ago, we would have said like, oh, okay, so we've got some local folks, and they moved in, and they built a round house, and you've got the, the um, occupying Romans, and somebody built a square house, and they're all living right outside happily, you know, 
under the shadow of the fort wall, which sounds like not a great place to live <laughs> from my perspective. But, you know, so that's how this whole thing would have been, you know, easily interpreted. And when you start to look at the material culture, the very robust material culture, the stuff that would be left behind by just about anybody anywhere has some interesting patterns. Now, almost as if you ordered it on cue and said, you know, what I would like from that space. Out of that round house came what you're looking at here. It's called a bun corn, a bun style corn. This is very much a local style corn. And I just realized everyone's like, what in the world is that? A corn, <laughs> a corn stone. It's a millstone. It's basically a hand millstone. So what you're looking at there, that stone um, is the very top. You would need a bottom that's also stone. And you can easily with a hand just turn it around and, and you mill wheat and then you um get you know flour and well i mean there's some steps in between but that's basically what you're doing there so this is a a, a sort of personalized kitchen item that you would have they, we do have from the ancient world and i'm uh, did anybody else grow up going to like the, the local grist mill from like the 18th century I grew up outside of boston and this was like a regular sunday afternoon you'd go <laughs> you'd go to the grist mill and then when you got to high school, you went and drank there, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, this is a, a local style. So known from Britain when, um, when pre-Roman Britain. So this was very much sort of in the Iron Age tradition. And it was in the roundhouse. It's like, oh, okay, wow. Well, that looks kind of cool. And then in the, in the square house, we have a Roman style. So this is called a discorn. This was very much in keeping. Also, as you can see from the scales, also a handheld one, also a sort of personalized, you know, kitcheny type household item. Um, you know, maybe you didn't do your your milling right in the kitchen, but you know, it's a it, it's for personal use. You don't need like a, a, a pack animal or something to turn this thing. And there it is. It's the very Roman style that then became ubiquitous after Roman conquest. And um, it's made of lava stone that was imported from Germany. And there it is sitting in the rectilinear house. So it's like, again, 50 years ago, you just go, well, case closed there. We're good, you know, all fine. But then when you take it a little bit further, things start to get a little bit cloudier. And I will also show that one thing that's really special about this anaerobic, about these, these conditions that we have, it gives you a much, much more robust picture. And that's gonna turn out to be really important here. So other than those cornstones, it's gonna turn out to be really important. So if we look at the material culture packages from both of these spaces, and when I say material culture package for any students or anything, that just means the stuff that came out of the house. So that kind of robust items, those everyday objects, things that they were using and dropping and breaking and sweeping off into the corner and not picking up. We have from the rectilinear house, so here we are in the square house, a, uh, typically Roman style knives with bone handles. So we can very much see that 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 horizon um, in, in archaeology across Britain, things that were there before the Romans got there and things that the Romans brought in, right? So that that's always a very clear. So Roman style knives with bone handles, Mortaria sherds with stamps, and that's what you're looking at right here. A mortarium is just like a mortar and pestle from our world. Um, come, the word comes obviously right from there. Um, it's a particular kind of, of vessel that we find. Uh, beads and rings and bracelets that were all very Roman in their character. If we're thinking about something that we could call Roman, this is what we call our typical Roman material culture package. Brooches, several of them, decorative studs. There's also writing implements. There are various metal objects and fragments of all kinds. Okay, so that's from the rectilinear house. And you might say, okay, fine, we expect that. It's square, it's got a disc horn, I'm happy with all this. But then if we jump over to the roundhouse, that's exactly what we see over there. It's the exact same material culture package. Got these Roman style knives, these mortaria shirts, the beads, the rings, the brooches, everything. Add in a couple other things, needles, gaming counters, all these things that come in with Roman conquest that are very much part of um, the, the, what we would call a habitus of being Roman, the, the kind of way of living. You're, you're playing these games that are Roman. You're using a bronze oligula. That little word right there is actually an ear cleaner, a bronze little thing that you would potentially clean. Your, you could use it for several other things, I can imagine. But, um, so the point is that from both of these spaces, we get a very typical package of material that we would just say, 
Roman. It looks like the same kind of stuff that's found in Gaul and in Iberia and the same kind of stuff that's coming out of military forts and the same kind of stuff that's coming outside of the fort nearby. And it's just, it's, it's not terribly different. But at Vindolanda, we have this anaerobic, these oxygen-reduced archaeological environments that provide us with a huge amount of information because we're getting wood. So all of the tablets that Alex was talking about yesterday, those would not be preserved. All of the wood, all of the leather, um, bone in a much more robust state. Bone is actually fairly robust, and you will find that in non-anaerobic um, uh, conditions. But here you'll get these very um, small, let's see, bone game counters and all sorts of incised, all, really interesting stuff. And then metal is also much better preserved. It doesn't come out in like a green blob or a rusted blob. It comes out perfect. You just go and you can read the coin and, you know, it's perfect. So I'll show you, actually, that's, if you look at that brooch right there, that's bronze without any bronze disease or anything. We're used to from archaeology seeing that bright green, but it's not. So the, this just gives you a, a little piece of what the, the potential of anaerobic environments, what you're looking at right here, I'm looking straight down with the camera onto, that is a planked wooden floor right there. Those are just three planks with their... Um, that's a sleeper beam there. It's sort of set in and it's, it's resting on these supports right there. Um, over here, that's Alex right there, just in case anyone's wondering, like 15 years ago. <laughs> um, that's Trudy Buck, who also does research with me, and her name is on the last slide. They, they're excavating this anaerobic. They're in a ditch in this case, so not in um, an occupied sort of a domestic space, in a ditch here. But so the potential of these spaces, so much is preserved. Anything that was put in there in antiquity, and it, it's there now, you know, in practically perfect condition for us. So that's why we get so excited about. So, okay, with this space, we have that ability to look at all this anaerobic stuff and see what is going on here, because then the picture just starts to blur. We would have just had these kind of Roman style brooches and all of this different stuff. Um, but uh, with all this other material, we are going to see a, a much bigger picture. And one of those things is this new, I'm looking at a kind of potential for a new or different construction style. You're looking at fallen wattle and daub. So if you're kind of wondering, what in the world is this? There's that cornstone. If you're looking at the, that right there, this is what we call wattle and daub. That should be upright. So it's fallen over. It's like this. It should be up like this. So wattle and daub, you've got these uprights like you can see here. And then, and there, and there's probably another one over here somewhere. And then you weave these smaller sort of supple pieces in between. And then you would plaster over this. The plaster is gone. You would plaster over this. They would paint over it, things like that. Um, it, it depends how nice the building is. This might not have ever actually had, this might have just had a daub, like um, basically a uh, kind of clay temper mixed with things that you kind of solidify the wall with, right? And... Another thing that they were doing here that we have never seen anywhere else, and now one of the kind of curses of Vindolanda is that we don't have 20 other anaerobically preserved sites that we can compare to. We don't have wattle and daub walls all over the empire, and we can say, well, this looks different from the wattle and daub in Italy, or in, it's just we don't have that. We don't have another assemblage of 5,000 shoes. We don't have another 1,000 tablets that we can compare. So in a way, you know, I say it's a curse. I mean, it's kind of awesome, really. But we look at things and we see new things and we say, hey, I wonder if this is typical or not. And, and we do have some compar comparable sites, like in the Netherlands and whatnot. Um, there is anaerobic elsewhere, but we have so much of it here. So what we started to notice was that they're actually weaving leather into this wattle and daub. Like, so in between here and I'll show you this next slide. You've got, you can't really tell because the, the leather, the wattle and the dirt is pretty, and the soil is pretty much all the same color. So I'm making these arrows. That's actually the edge of a shoe, if you can believe it. Um, there's some leather right there. There's some leather over here and they're actually weaving it through. You would think, oh, did the leather just kind of get stuck in there? No, you can tell it's very intentional. It's woven in. And I think they're using this as a damp course. And once I started talking about it with some of the other um, specialists in Roman leather that work in the Northwest, we started to say, hey, wait a minute. I remember this thing was here and that thing was there. So at Vindolanda, it seems like they're also using it uh, around the same time period 
in um, the bottom of the rampart. So the rampart is that big kind of mound that you would put up against the fort wall and that kind of protects. And then they're using it at the base of that. So again, maybe as some sort of, because so you're not really insulating there. It could be insulation here. Um, and then a researcher, a, a colleague from the Netherlands mentioned, oh yeah, I think they're using it in the floors at this other site. So there's another potential paper that they're using. But but for my point here, they we seem to have this new and interesting and different kind of construction technique that maybe is coming in just with the people who are living here. So maybe we have this sort of kind of local flair on an otherwise sort of more, more global idea of, of construction. If we move away from that and we look at the material evidence, I never really know where to put this slide of material evidence because, or for, sorry, material evidence for writing, because writing, we actually have both anaerobic and, or we both have organic and inorganic, non-organic. And that is the metal stylus pens right here. Those you would find. So I did put those on the list of, of things that you would be able to see without this organic preservation. But the writing tablets themselves. So here in both of these spaces, we have stylus pens, we have stylus tablets or some fragments of. So what Alex was talking about, um, they're associated with both structures, both the round and the rectilinear. We also have an ink pen nib that was found in the roundhouse. And that is this kind of iron pen nib that often people actually, you might see them in museums labeled as an ox code. It's not what they are, they're pen nibs. Um, and then also an ink tablet found in the roundhouse. And the reason why I find this really interesting here, well, Alex and I were talking about it last night, the pens, one thing that's funny about the pens that maybe it does work having it in anaerobic because oftentimes when a pen is very, a, a stylus pen is very corroded, it actually just gets identified as like a nail or, you know, something else, a hairpin or something else. So because they come out so perfectly, we can actually definitely say, okay, they are, uh, they are um, stylus pens. So that's nice. Um, but the reason why I'm interested in this whole sort of conglomeration of writing evidence here is just the fact that we have writing implements out in this extramural space at this time when people sort of have this very, researchers forever and ever and ever had this sort of pejorative idea about the extramural spaces, about that vicus. And in fact, in, in my dissertation, there's all these great quotes of modern scholars, like calling them shanty towns. And like, it, they're not hard to find these kind of fun. It's not the way the last 10 years or so we've really kind of, that has been really rehabilitated and, and we recognize that as a sort of legitimate community that is, um, is uh, you know, a part of this military life, a part of the military community. And we, we consider now that extramural settlement and the fort as the, as the military community, not just the soldiers here and this kind of ramshackle group of people that just kind of happens to live outside the fort because that model doesn't actually make any sense when you think about it. But we never have really thought about this group as, let's say, being literate, particularly coming out of a roundhouse, a space where we thought, oh, this is probably like some local people that we never really thought about them writing Latin. Um, now, these, if I remember correctly, Alex, these fragments are very small, right? We didn't, we couldn't really get anything. We know their tablets. We know they've got some writing on them, but they're very small. So we can't really say much more about them, which is too bad. But just the fact that there is an abundance of writing material in these, these spaces outside goes against a lot of our expectations of class and status at this time in this particular space. So actually, if you kind of, you know, take a broader look on it rather than looking closely at what those tablets might say, then you see a, a sort of different vision of that extramural settlement at the, particularly at this early period. If this were the third century, we'd say, sure, yeah, you know, fair. We've had several hundred years of conquest, but at this point, we wouldn't normally expect that. Another really interesting find, we've got these wooden combs that um, are very much a Roman style, a very Roman um, kind of thing to have. And we have an abundance of them, an interesting abundance of them. A couple outside the space, so those might represent a discard pattern, and then a couple coming from outside, or sorry, inside of both of those spaces. And again, adopted by people living or being used by those in both of these spaces. We can say something about consumption practices. And this is really, I love this one. The hazelnuts are in the rectilinear house. So hazelnuts, why does that matter? The idea of, um, I should just go back real quick. It's not just like a hazelnut or two. There were like 450 hazelnuts or something like that. 
And this whole entire kind of pit was dug out to hold these precious hazelnuts. Now, when you think about who is the type of group, let's say, to consume extensive numbers, large numbers of hazelnuts, it is not the Romans. The Romans were aware of hazelnuts. They do come into um, recipes like that guy Apicius that some of you may have heard of. Um, we do, they, they were eating hazelnuts. It was not a huge part of their diet though. It wasn't something that came into like every recipe. But the people that did, in fact, if you go all the way back to the Mesolithic and straight through the Iron Age in Britain and in sort of Northwest Europe, all of those kind of pre-Roman, they were mad for hazelnuts. And every Iron Age site has, and Bronze Age, Iron Age, and all the way back to the Mesolithic, you get hazelnuts and lots and lots and lots of them on in archaeological excavations and obviously kind of, you know, hoarded, brought together to, to be used. And there's some, like, I have all the, a couple of people in Britain would say to me, oh yeah, and they also made this drink out of it that was kind of like coffee and like that. And I've had a couple of people say this to me and I can't, for the life of me, find any published thing about this. And then this was supposedly kind of Iron Age, Bronze Age, like this was a, an old tradition. And I just, I can't find it anywhere. So if anybody knows anything or ever reads anything about it, please send me the link. Like it's just, you know, you think, oh yeah, I'll just go to the internet and they'll tell, you know, the internet will tell me. No, it's like nowhere. There, I can't find anything. But more than one person has said this to me. It's usually an older British man. So I'm not really sure if, <laughs> I don't know if that's got anything to do with it. But um, so yeah, that's sort of a bit of a mystery, but the, 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 it's not a mystery that we've got this stash of hazelnuts. But take note, the hazelnuts are in the rectilinear house, which on that old binary, we would have said, oh, that would be the Roman house, you know, but it, it doesn't look like we're staying true to that binary. And thank goodness. Um, okay. And then everybody likes to see shoes. So you've got to put them in here. We've got some really interesting shoes from this space as well. So I, I was out to dinner last night and I said, please, I said to Ruth, remind me if I haven't yet said that we actually have thousands and thousands of leather shoes, but I believe I started with that just so I wouldn't forget. But here we are. This is, these are about five of the over 5,000 shoes that we have from this site, from all periods of this site. So really interesting group of footwear coming out of here. This is what you're looking at, a pair of what we call a carbatina, a pair of, uh, a pair of carbatina or two carbatini. This is sort of a house shoe. Uh, we think that because all Roman shoes practically have a um, series of studs on the bottom of, of, of iron studs, these little hobnails, we call them as well. And that's to give you a robust walking surface. And these seemed not to, they don't have that at all. It's just one single piece. It's more like a slipper, more like something that you would just kind of slide on your feet. Though I say that, and we've always said, yeah, they seem to be sort of a house shoe, but then every single one is worn at the heel and the under the toes, under the ball of the foot. So they're obviously running outside and like getting the paper or something in these things, just like we all do in our slippers. And we know we shouldn't, but we do. Um, or our socks. Actually, I do it in my socks. Anybody else? Um, and they're all worn down there. So, but it seems like sort of that kind of thing. Now, they're usually very, very simple. And when I say simple, I mean just they have your leather on the bottom. You come up, you've got these little triangles, you lace them together, and that's that. So this is actually a rather decorative pair of uh, a pair of carpetina right here which is sort of interesting. Uh, and when I say phase one in here, it, that comes out of phase one of the, of the house. So this one is from the rectilinear house, the, or this pair. So it's a much nicer carbatina than we would normally expect. We were also quite surprised by this one. We have a very fine child sandal, which is also associated with the rectilinear structure. Another, one of the other kinds of shoes actually that doesn't have studs, it just has a kind of flat um, leather, thick cowhide piece of leather. But the top, as you can see, is rather, it's not so much decorative, it's just rather fine. It would have taken a fair bit. It's not gonna be your cheapest shoe out there. Um, so that was interesting as well, kind of coming out of this extramural space, but that is also from the rectilinear house. And then the nicest shoe that came out of the whole place is this one right here. It doesn't look so nice, I recognize, I understand that. They don't all look great. Um, you're like, is that even a shoe, you sure? <laughs> Um, this is what we call a fishnet shoe. It's got a fishnet upper. So what you're looking at, if I had shown you two pictures, I would have pulled this little upper piece kind of away and you would have seen the sole right there. 
And that's the back heel piece. And it's kind of flared out because it's come out from its, you know, secured spot. It used to be inside there. And then this is part of the upper. That's the heel. That part right there would have run like right up here on your, on your shoe. And why this is so interesting to me, this, this fishnet style, has anybody read any of my articles? I have this article from 2014. Melissa knows it that says, you will only find these shoes in very high-end spaces inside the fort. So we find this and I'm like, oh. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I guess that's not true. But what's really cool about finding that out here is that otherwise, other than this shoe, we only find these fishnet uppers in really high-end spaces. They come from the, for the most part, the Praetorium, which is the commanding officer's residence. So we have some really nice, our nicest shoes come from our period three Praetorium. The officer, his family, they're all wearing really kind of some nice kicks. This is really quite a surprise and it's also coming out of the roundhouse. So if we had any sort of preconceived notions about what sort of material culture we ought to be finding out here, it's all just been blown out of the water. We've got writing implements, we've got really nice shoes, but at the exact same time as we're finding this nice pair of carpetini, this very nice fishnet shoe, we're also finding literally homemade shoes. These shoes right here, this one, actually, this is just the same shoe flipped over. And then I'll show you that one as well. They are both literally homemade carbatini. You can tell because of the way they are cut. They're very crudely cut. They are, um, you can tell that the, the slits right here are just really, they look like they're cut with a scissor. And you would just simply wrap that piece of leather around your foot and you would slide a lace through there and around there and you would just kind of, and, you, and you'd, you'd lace it up. That is incredibly homemade. This one as well, this is the same kind of thing. It's just, when I first saw it, I didn't even actually know it was a shoe. I was like, huh? But then I started to look at what we call wear use patterns. And when you look at wear use, you can see that on the bottom, I don't have a good picture of the bottom, but let me show you the bottom of this one. These are very typical wear patterns of a shoe. They always wear out in the heel. You've got that extra wear in under the ball of the foot. So that one is definitely a shoe. Also, this one actually has the, what we call the heel seam. There's a seam. So the leather has to be, you know, it's got to be broken somewhere and sewn. And they often do that in the back of the heel when it's just this one single piece of leather. Here, you've also got that right there. You can see that the lace pulled it up over time, right? So when you start to look at the wear use pattern, like, oh my gosh, this is actually a shoe. This was definitely worn as a shoe. And this one actually also has that seam on the back there. So we have, in addition to some of the nicest shoes that we could find on site, we also have some of the most homemade, just, you know, I don't want to say the worst shoes, but I don't want to put any kind of, you know, homemade. I've got lots of friends that make their clothes these days, you know, nothing wrong with that. But certainly you're sort of lower end in terms of who can buy. I'm sure they're probably not like a, doing the Etsy thing here. I think they're probably, it's probably a necessity of the household that they are wearing something homemade. They're kind of crudely rendered, but they're still in this same model of that Carbatina. And then we also have a shoe that comes out of the same space uh, that is, um, this one is, was found in a discard pile between the two places. So it's hard to say whether that came from one or the other, but it was most definitely patched. And we do not, this isn't one of a thousand shoes that are patched and reused. No, we probably have about four shoes where we can see that they were very clearly patching them and reusing um, and, and extending the life. And this is one of them right here. So you can see the, um, little sewn marks right there. And these are the actual patches. That one right there actually went just there. So they are trying to extend the life of this shoe. They, we've got these homemade shoes. So there's definitely a sort of lower end character to a lot of what's happening here. And now that is really important also because we see that in other material culture from the space. So one of the brooches, I'd mentioned earlier that there were lots of brooches that come out. One of the brooches also has this make, do, and mend character to it. It is got a plate right here. It's a slightly different, I mean, they're both bronze, let's say, but actually we really just should be calling this copper alloy. This one you can tell has a higher copper content because it's more, that, that's got more of that sort of orangey color. So they're definitely fixing this. They are putting this plate on to extend the plate, the use, it's, that's the catch plate right there. So that's the, um, 
the pin goes into the catch plate, if you could see the other side there. So they need this, they want to continue using this. So it's a nice brooch, but they also don't want to just ditch it when it when it's broken, they want they fix it. So we're seeing that make do and men character. And like I said, we don't get many, we don't have barely any brooches that have been fixed. We don't get a lot of material culture that's fixed. Roman material culture in this kind of context is usually pretty much disposable. It's H and M. You're just getting rid of it. You're you know you're using it up. As far as we can tell, they just seem to be discarding this whenever they want. So what I want to do now is is analyze this a little bit. When we look at all of this together, the non-organic material culture. So part of this comes from some of the work that I do that's sort of showing the potential of anaerobic conditions and what we need to look out for and what we need to remember that we're not seeing in the archaeological record. And part of this comes from my work on local and global and doing all this sort of globalization work. And I've kind of brought them both together here for this talk to show you that when we just have the non-organics, all you're looking at, all you see are, you might get some of this. You would definitely have seen, this is a clay bank right here. If you were lucky enough to have the post holes, um, I mean, usually you do have post holes if they could be recognized. So in other words, if the the soil that filled in where the wood had deteriorated, if we were in a, in a non-anaerobic um, kind of environment, if that was all available to you, then you would have seen that this was round and you would have seen that this was square, but you might not. In fact, sometimes post holes are, are elusive. You don't always see that sort of thing. If you weren't even seeing that, you would just have a scatter of what we would typically just say is a very typical Roman, cult, Roman material culture package, brooches and pottery and knives and corns and writing implements and beads and rings and things like that. When you add in the organic, so when you think about what is typically missing from an archaeological environment, you get this whole story. You see so much more. First of all, you get the roundhouse and the square house. You see what's going on there. You get the architect architectural style and this new potential construction where they're adopting maybe new practices or bringing in old practices into this new space, actually, which I think is probably more likely. You see that, there, that you've got this personal hygiene with the combs, you've got all of the written word, the tablets, the stylus and the ink um, tablets. You've got all of that footwear that's showing us both very high status shoes right next to homemade shoes and repaired shoes. Consumption habits with these hazelnuts and, and different animal ones. There's like so much happening here that if we didn't have any of this organic material, we would just be like, psh, typical day at Vindolanda. Typical brooches, typical this, typical that. It wouldn't be, it would just be like, okay, hey. So that's something to remember. So what does all this mean? How do we interpret all of this evidence? What do we know about the period four population? This is why if you think back to the, that first cohort of, uh, uh, cohorts one Tungrorum, that's the first cohort of Tungrians. We have the ninth cohort of Batavians. We have um, Varduli cavalry. Who am I missing, Alex? That's kind of the, 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 the first couple of periods. Um, but in this period four, we know from a lot of different evidence that we have the first cohort of Tungrians. Now, the Tungrians, we were thinking, who the heck are they? Is she ever going to tell us? They hailed from northern Gaul. That's modern Belgium, this area around modern Belgium. Um, we also know that we had a vexillation of Varduli cavalry there from the Iberian Peninsula. And again, like I said in the beginning, these are all people who had been conquered by the Roman Empire. By you know, brought, they were they were brought into that Roman Empire. They were um, either either forced into military. They could have had a hand in saying, "Hey, I want to go." We just have to remember all of that kind of messy side of conquest and consolidation, right? And that. They're probably not all thrilled about this situation. Um, we also probably have uh, recruits from other parts of the empire. So uh, there's a whole other backstory about the Roman army, about when they actually started to recruit locally, meaning from wherever was a kind of um, logical place to recruit people from at that point in time. We don't mean they went down to the village down here and said, okay, you're going to be in the army now. That doesn't seem to be the way it worked. But we have a real dynamic group here of people, of soldiers, first of all, from all different parts of the empire, or at least a couple of different parts of the empire. And then when you throw in there all of the people that might have tagged along with them, all of the families and all the other people that are living out in that extramural settlement. So they're of auxiliary status. So they are not the legions. They did not have Roman citizenship. 
And that will not happen until after retirement. So once they serve 25 years, an auxiliary is, get, is given citizenship. Their children are given citizenship, not their wives. Of course, right? We get screwed every time. The, those living in the extramural settlement may have been families of those soldiers. They might have been merchants. They could also have been local Bretons. Now, sometimes I put a little caveat that local Bretons, there is no definite evidence. We don't have any material culture evidence other than, let's say, that bun corn or something like that, little bits of things here and there. But we don't have any overwhelming evidence that suggests that you've got groups of people that did live, you know, let's say five or 10 miles down the road and thought, hey, let's set up shop outside the fort. That doesn't, um, that doesn't seem to be playing out in the archaeology unless they adopted whole cloth, another set of material culture entirely. But we do have the fact that, you know, you've got somebody building a round house, which is not typically Roman. You've got the use of the bun corn. Um, but again, none of these people have Roman citizenship. When I say that they are not the legions, that they are not the families of legionary soldiers, this is important, right? Because the legions actually are very close. They're in York. So, okay, it's not very close probably in, you know, a Roman standard. It's very close on a North American standard. But even my British colleagues, when I write that, they're like, that's not very close at all. I'm like, oh, is it? No, no. Oh. Um, but York is pretty close. You would have had legionary soldiers coming through. They, auxiliary soldiers knew that they were not legionary soldiers. They knew that they did not have citizenship. They knew that they did not make as much money as, as legionary soldiers. Probably there's a whole debate on that one as well. Um, and we've got soldiers here and their extended military communities living on the very edge of the empire in this newly established frontier. This is before the construction of Hadrian's Wall. So what I'm trying to point out here is that there's like marginalization going on everywhere. There, there are so many different ways to kind of look at this group of people and suggest that um, they're kind of, you know, maybe make do and mend or make do and do whatever you can was sort of that would have to be the motto out there always. Um, and thinking about how they would interact with this sort of global forces of first sort of this incorporation into the Roman Empire, and second, the kind of all of the, the markets, the economy, everything that's coming through, all of those, that new material culture, all of those things that um, maybe were new to some people and not new to other people, right? That, that's the thing, this complexity, you can't just say that everyone suddenly went, oh, look at these brooches. You know, there, there are going to be so many different perspectives in this one place. And so trying to kind of map that local, uh, that global onto local or global onto global, that sort of thing, it's sort of like, which is it? Which comes first? It's all very complex, but it creates a very, um, a, a nice way of sort of thinking through how this material culture might have been experienced and how this space might have been experienced. Because something that I always think about too is that they're in the shadow of the fort, right? They are literally, if we went all the way back to that, that they are just, just when I say north of, I mean like 10 feet north of the fort wall and those gates. And that would have been something rather, I think, um, I don't know, it could be foreboding to one person, it could be safety to another, you know, I don't know, it's hard to say, but they are in the shadow of that fort wall. So when we think about the global and the local at Vindolanda, the Roman army and everything that satellites around it represent basically that kind of globalized world of this military frontier. And I'm also kind of simplifying here, there's a lot more to think about here, um, because we also don't want to fall into this trap of creating just new binaries, right? <laughs> Saying, oh, well, this is this is the global thing and that's the local thing. It's really more, we have to think about kind of everything, the pathways that move in between it. But the local context of the frontier within the specific populations, the origins of inhabitants, we have to understand the localized response to these globalized forces because this is gonna be different everywhere. We have to really think about who is living at Vindolanda, who could be using and experiencing this space. And the last thing I want to point out is these two inscriptions right here. We know that for quite some time at Vindolanda, there was a definition between groups. And there were expressions of group identity that were not Roman, that were not sort of saying, hey, you were all Romans now, right? The one on the left, this right here, really interesting. That was found in, uh, was that the rainy year, Alex, of Ardua? That was the rainy year as well, 2012. Um, 
the so again we had to move up because it was so rainy and we were getting flooded and we found this great inscription in the period four so this dates to period four this was actually quite close to the spaces that we're talking about here it's an inscription to a goddess of vardua and if you're thinking who is that you're right this is the only mention of a vardua it was given by the Tungrians. You can actually see this right here. You can see the end of the H from the cohorts. This is the way this is always represented epigraphically. C-O-H, we've got the H there. We've got the one there. And then we've got the T-U-N-G. So this is the first cohort of Tungrians, which we know about from the tablet. So this is all fine and good. We know, we thought, we knew we were physically in the period four ditch. So that all worked out, which is nice when it does. Um, and here they are. We think the, the, the article on this, oh, I have written it for you just in case anyone's super interested in this, that Burly Burly Stempel article. It's in um, ZPE, the Zeitschrift for Papyrologie und Epigraphie. Um, that is uh, the only mention of a Vardua. And it seems to be coming from this sort of northwestern region of the empire and maybe even closer to where the Tungrians are from. So it seems to be this local deity. When I say local, though, what I mean local, I mean actually the Tungrians. The Tungrians seem to be bringing this potentially from their homeland. Um, either that or it could have some local, much more local connotation, and it's being kind of incorporated into this uh, local context at Vindolanda with this military. So that's a really interesting piece of evidence. But I also like to show the one on the right, which is something that shows that a that hundred years later, if not more, you still have this separation of groups. And what, what we're seeing here is an inscription that says, you can't make this one out quite as well. This one is just so beautiful. This one right here says the Kiwes Gali de Gallia Concordes Que Britanni. And that means the Gallic citizens to the goddess Gallia and in agreement, the Bretons. So they're very much 100 years later still separating themselves. They're saying, you're the Bretons and we're the, the Gauls. And we do know that we have the fourth cohort of Gauls on site in the period. This was actually found reused upside down in a toilet drain. So, which of course the Brits thought was hilarious because they're all like, the Concord, it's what, you know, like the Etant Concordia, Concordia, yeah, right? That, they see the, the French and the British, they hated each other forever, right? And here, this was like upside down in a toilet drain. So yeah, it was it was rather amusing. And it's to the goddess Gallia, another one you don't often see, um, not in this context, not in Britain, you don't often see dedications to the goddess of the, the place, of places like Gaul, things like that. But what's important here, I think, is this separation between the two groups. All of these years later, we're talking about sort of third century here. So it's it's well after conquest, you know, and, and that, that distinction is still being made. So the local always needs to be considered. The local can always change, especially on a site like Vindolanda or any auxiliary site, any military site like this, where you've got units coming and going, people coming and going. Um, but it's really nice, I think, to take these sort of micro histories. So really what I'm doing here is looking at a micro history of a place and trying to pull out some sense of how this place was experienced, how this material culture was experienced, who was using it, and try to find those channels in between something that we call Roman, which means very little in this context, and something that we call local glocalization is this kind of bringing it all together and then then you have to get into all this deep theory and whatnot but we'll leave it there for today since it's friday afternoon <laughs> thank you very much